What does it take to preserve railroad art? Today on The Roundhouse, we're going to find out. All aboard! In days past, the Roundhouse was where the railroad worker united with the steam locomotive, each to prepare for the journey ahead. Today, it's where we examine the history, the industry, the machines, the hobby, and the passion behind railroading. News, interviews, stories, and more. So climb aboard. This is The Roundhouse. Welcome to The Roundhouse. I'm your host, Nick Ozerak, and this is episode number 81 of our Trains and Railroading podcast, where we're talking about everything in the industry and the hobby. You name it, and we discuss it. Today, we're talking to Scott Lotus. He is the president and executive director of the Center for Railroad Photography and Art. And we're talking about what is the center? What does it do? How is it important to preserve all of this photography of decades past? And how do you accomplish that task? Because when you think of railroad preservation, chances are you're thinking of a piece of equipment that needs to be restored or a building. But you probably aren't thinking about those hundreds of thousands of negatives that exist out there in private collections that document so much of railroad history in its own right. And that's what the center is about. And that's what we're going to learn more about from Scott. Before we get started, though, I want to dedicate this episode to one of the co-founders of the center, and that is John Gruber. When I recorded this episode with Scott in Madison, I also had the opportunity to meet John. He treated me to dinner. We had a great conversation about rail preservation and communication in the 21st century. He wanted to come on the show, talk about his recent book about BB and Clegg. And he was somebody that I fully intended to interview. And then sadly, he passed away this last fall. So just to make it clear why we don't reference him passing in the interview is because that was from the summer, but also to say that we lost somebody who was a great photographer, but also a great visionary in terms of what he was setting to do with this organization. So John, I'm sorry I didn't get to have you on the show, but thank you for the dinner and thank you for everything that you've done for our rail fan community. Our guest today is the president and executive director of the Center for Railroad Photography and Art. Please welcome to the Roundhouse, Mr. Scott Lotus. Thanks, Nick. I'm so glad to be here, and I'm glad that you're here with us in Madison today. It's really a pleasure to be here. What is the Center for Railroad Photography and Art? Well, it's a great place to start. Uh, we actually celebrated our 20th anniversary last year. Uh, we were founded in 1997 by John Gruber. and. You know, I think John perceived uh, an, a need in the railroad community for an image-based organization, and, and that's really what the center is. Our mission is to preserve and present significant images of railroading. Uh, there's just this great history between railroading and the visual arts. Um, you know, the steam locomotives were 1820s, the daguerreotype, the first successful commercial photographic process was 1839, and so these these two technologies really grew up together in the, the 19th century and the railroad was just you know such a, a visually rich subject matter for photographers and for artists working in other media as well uh, you know some of the early painters in the or the painters in the 19th century um, you know did some work that really contextualized this new technology at coming into the landscape and, and some of their work really um, you know made something like an industrial subject like the railroad a suitable topic for fine art consideration and so there's this, this great tradition of fine arts and railroads and also folk art, uh, just this tremendous amateur photography following of railroads. And there are so many great organizations out there that are focused on restoring structures and operating uh, locomotives and scenic train rides. But there wasn't really one that had a, a really specific mandate for, for images. And there's this, just this incredible depth of subject matter with so many talented photographers and artists who have done so much great work and continue to do so. Uh, and so, you know, into to that void the, came the center, and I think it's really, uh, we've, you know, we've been growing fast, we're, we're doing a lot of good work, and within our, our, our mission to preserve and present, so you know, those are kind of both equally important to us. Obviously, we want to preserve great photographs and artwork, keep it safe and available and accessible, but also present it, so it doesn't really do anyone any good if, 
a great collection of slides or negatives or prints, you know, sits in a storage facility someplace, even if it's perfectly safe. We want it to be out there and accessible and available to the public online through our websites, but also in traveling exhibits and publications and available for other people to use. So we put together our own publications and exhibits, and we also make images available for other groups and individuals to use. How do you determine what you take on as part of your collection? Because obviously there are so many, let's just say millions of historic photographs out there of railroading. What determines, especially in this day and age where now digital photography makes it so easily accessible, what are the criteria set for taking in collections and, and staying focused to that mission? Yeah, no, that's that's a, a good question, and it's 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 certainly something we give a lot of thought to. You know, as we were doing some strategic planning and thinking about how we wanted to build up our archives, I spoke with directors of a lot of different museums within and outside the railroad community, and everyone I spoke to had you know some variation on the same theme of just you know be careful not to over collect because you you don't really serve your mission or your community if you take on so much that you, you bury yourself in it, essentially. And so we want to be careful with that. Obviously, we want to be ambitious and take on as much as we can. So it's, you know, it's a delicate balancing act. In terms of what criteria we're looking for, I mean, one of the things that, that we've discovered is there's such a tremendous photography following, especially. There's a lot of great art besides photography out there. But a lot of those early paintings are already safely housed someplace. Now there are a number of painters out there doing some great work right now. You know, and those are things that we'll want to think about, although a lot of paintings get sold into private collections or commissions. But the photography really does come up uh, for a lot of availability in terms of taking it on and, and preserving it. And, and there's so much great photography out there. And we, you know, we found that within any collection, there are some truly memorable images. And so it's, it's a real temptation to just take everything, essentially, or at least try. In terms of what we're, you know, we're, we're looking for, right now, I'd say we're, we're pretty focused on steam to diesel transition era, the photographers who were out there after World War II when there was this real boom in amateur photography. Camera technology was better. Following the war, economic times were good in the US. People were able to travel more easily. There were better roads and cars, and so there was just kind of this, all these factors coming together that, that let people get out and photograph more. And of course, it was a fascinating time in railroad history. You had the transition from steam to diesel. You still had a lot of private passenger operations going on, and, and pretty successfully in the years immediately after the war, and the railroads were busy. There was just great variety. You know, and we're at the point now where, whether we like to admit it or not, the great photographers of that era have either passed on already or probably will be in the not-too-distant future. And, you know, so we feel like there's this very critical window right now to try to take on as much of that work as we can and preserve it. We were very fortunate to get the collection of Wallace Abbey uh, from, uh, actually from him, as well as his wife and his two daughters uh, all made that donation to us. Uh, just a couple of years before he died. He died in 2014, and we took that collection on, I believe, in 2010 or 2011. About 23,000 black and white negatives uh, and about 10,000 colored slides. And Abby was someone who, who worked for Trains Magazine in the 1950s, and he worked for the Sioux Line and the Milwaukee Road in their public relations department. When he was at Trains, he published widely, but once he was in you know, the private sector, he was doing mainly work for internal publications. Uh, and so other than a, a very memorable book he did on the Sioux Line, his work wasn't seen all that widely, and it hasn't been seen uh, that much recently. And so this was a collection that was highly significant, and that we, but that also didn't people didn't know about Abbey the way they know about a Steinheimer or a Shaughnessy or a Hastings or something like that. You know, we felt that it was important to to not only take on this collection, but also raise some visibility for it. And we were fortunate to publish with Indiana or partner with Indiana University Press uh, earlier this year to publish a book on Abbey's collection. Uh, we're making more of that available on our website right now. And so it's collections like that that have really strong imagery in them, but also, you know, a strong historical component to them and that, you know, kind of fit within the right time and place for us. Our goal in building up our archive is to be not a comprehensive archive because I, I frankly don't think that's possible for any one organization to do, but we very much want to be a representative archive. And so we want to have examples in our collection from all eras, all subject matter, all styles of photography. We can't take on every single great image from all of those, but we certainly want to have a representation of all of those. The best locomotive portraits from the 1930s when that was really the, the focus on railroad photography, those great action shots from the 40s right up until today, color black and white. We're trying to 
to sort of strategically look at what we already have in our collections and, and sort of what holes we feel that we've filled and then which areas that we really feel like we have some, some room to, to grow and take on. So it's every collection that's submitted to us, there are guidelines on our website for the submission process. We want to look at some sample images. We want to know about how much space the collection takes up, how many images are in it, how well it's documented, how it's housed. I mean, these are all the concerns that we have from an archival standpoint. Uh, and so those are all important to know going in. And then beyond that, we have a, a collections and acquisitions committee from our board of directors who reviews every collection that's submitted to us. And, you know, they're all sort of case by case decisions because every collection has its strengths, everyone has its weaknesses, everyone has its redundancies, everyone has its very unique factors. And so it's just kind of looking at all of those and seeing how they fit with what we already have and, you know, what opportunities they might present in terms of publications and exhibitions. What are some of the most notable collections you have and what qualities about them make them so comprehensive? Well, so Abby's already mentioned, and he had this, you know, it was just this perfect sort of melding of someone with a really strong journalistic and artistic eye, but who also had tremendous access through his work at Trains Magazine and then through his work at the Sioux Line and the Milwaukee Road and, and some other industry places. So, you know, he had kind of this industry insider's perspective, uh, but then he had, you know, a strong journalistic background and just, just a really great eye. And so all those came together to, to uh, I think, create just a, a really strong body of work. Uh, we were very fortunate to take on Jay Parker Lamb's photography a few years ago, and this is someone else who was, he was kind of right at that tail end of the steam era, but unlike some photographers of that time, he didn't get frustrated and quit when the steam locomotives went away. He continued to shoot, and I think Parker's work is a strong example of someone who kind of made their peace with the diesel and really created a strong body of work to show those early years, you know, all the way up into the 1980s and 1990s of diesel transportation and how that changed that whole era. He, you know, he got the end of the private passenger train era, the beginning of Amtrak. He shot the, some of the first stack trains on the Southern Pacific in the 1980s. And so thankfully, you know, he and others like him were still out there with their cameras after the steam locomotives went away to show us this next kind of great generation of railroading. Parker's work is, is someone else that I'm just very glad that we have. Uh, it's a really strong addition to our collections. And another one I'd like to mention is uh, Ted Rose, who I think we all know for his watercolors, but in his early year, uh, years, in his late teens and early 20s, he was a very avid photographer. This was right at the end of the steam era as well, 1957 to 1962 was basically when he did almost all of his photography. And so he caught what was left in the U.S. at that point, he traveled to Canada, and then I think most memorably, he spent two extended summer trips in the summers of 1960 and 1961, trekking all over Mexico with his friend Bob Ludwig uh, in search of all the steam locomotives that were still operating down there. And this photography has just this tremendous slice of life aspect to it. I mean, you could already see Ted's visual sensibilities as, a, as an emerging watercolor artist coming out and his use of light in his photographs. And then he was traveling places where he was clearly welcomed, where, I don't know, the, the pace of life in Mexico, the workers there you know, clearly appreciated him being there and, and were sympathetic to what he was doing. And I think through that, he just got some tremendous images of, of how those railroads fit within the land and the peoples that they were serving. Ted's collection is one that came to us without a lot of caption information. And so in a place like Mexico, we don't have as many resources to figure out what's what there. Thankfully, his friend Bob Ludwig was able to look at a lot of these images for us and use his own notes to identify them. And even though we've had the collection for a few years, we just recently completed that work. And so I'm really excited to be sharing some of those on our website later this year. I think it's just a really strong body of work. And again, it, while a lot of our work is focused on the U.S., railroading is an international phenomenon. And I think it's interesting to, to look at other countries' rail systems and how they're used there and, and compare it to what we're doing here. I think that just broadens our own perspectives. It makes us appreciate the unique qualities of American railroads more. And I think it also helps us see you know, what other countries are, are doing and how railroads can be used in different places, uh, depending on the you know, on the location and the cultures and the political climates that they're in. And another collection that we have that has a lot of strong international components is that of Fred Springer, someone who didn't really publish, he shot really just for his own passion for it. He was very active in the steam preservation community at the Cumbres and Toltec and some other places, but traveled the world, including trips to Mexico in the 60s and in the 80s and in the 90s, and so he got sort of this whole sweeping change of the railroads there. And then he traveled all over the world. He got to the Middle East, Africa, 
Europe, Australia, uh, and photographed railroads in all of these places. And so this is a collection that gives us some really strong international coverage and allows us to set up some of those comparisons between American railroad systems and railroad systems in other parts of the country. And as we look at taking exhibitions to not only railroad museums, but also to more mainstream history or art museums, it's, it's nice to be able to have kind of that wide visual coverage. And we want to continue to build up both our domestic and international components of our collection as, you know, as we go forward for those same reasons. The international component strikes me as interesting because a lot can be said when you're looking at images that don't just have the train as the focus, but have people interacting with the train. And what is their relationship to that, visually speaking? Are they looking at it? Are they not looking at it? Are they bystanders? How are they interacting with it? And I think there's something culturally that can emerge from that as well. And so it must be interesting to see both the changes in attitudes, visual attitudes, you could say, over the eras in a single country, but then also to compare that internationally. Oh, I think so. And if I could share a brief story, my wife and I spent two years teaching English in Japan. And this was kind of my first, well, prior to that, I traveled in China um, before going to Japan, but all sort of part of the same two-year experience. And prior to that, I'd, I'd never left North America and really didn't have any great desire to do so. But my wife wanted to teach English in Japan. Um, actually, she was my fiance at the time. and, and um, I thought I should go too, and it sounded like a fun opportunity. Coincided with the end of steam in China, and I was able to catch some of the QJs running on the Jitong Railway um, in the fall of 2005, right at the, the 11th hour and 59th minute over there. And so this was kind of my exposure to railroading outside of the U.S., and it really opened my eyes and broadened my horizons. And Japan is a country that the railroad is just such an integral part of everyday life there, not so much for freight transport. It's an island nation. Ships handle most of the most of the bulk commodities, but to move people, I mean, railways are just integral to Japanese life. And one of the most fascinating things for me while I was there, uh, we befriended a middle-aged couple who had traveled quite a bit. They were Japanese, but had been all over the, the world and spoke fluent English. And so they were kind of our, our host family while we were there, uh, Fuki and Hiromi uh, Goto, uh, just uh, two wonderful people. And so, of course, I would you know go to the department stores and the bookstores and peruse the beautiful monthly magazines that came out on Japanese railways and occasionally I would buy them and occasionally I'd buy the, the books and there was a two-volume set. We lived on the island of Hokkaido in northern Japan and while I was there there was a two-volume set that came out about the history of railways in Hokkaido and of course I had to get those even though I couldn't barely read a word in them but the photographs were great and of course I wanted to know what they said so I took them to the best people I know, which was Fuki and Hiromi, to, to ask uh, what, you know, to ask about the captions and uh, specific questions I had. And of course, they weren't rail fans, um, but I, you know, I, brought, I brought these books and I was shocked at how interested they were in them because I don't really necessarily expect my non-rail friends in the United States to be that interested in, in railroad history books. But the Gotos were just fascinated by these books and they would turn through the pages and they'd stop on one and they'd, Hiromi would say, oh, yes, I remember we, my, my mother and sister and I would take the train and get off at the station and we'd pick berries and have a picnic there. And, and Fuki would talk about riding the trains to school as a child. And you know, this happened time and time again. And, you know, they'd, they'd lament the abandonment of a line that they had grown up riding and have these fond memories come back of places that they'd been. And I, I realized that for, for someone in Japan, seeing these photographs of, of the trains from their childhood was like a baby boomer in the U.S. seeing that 1957 Chevrolet with the, I mean, it was like that same level of nostalgia and that same, I don't know, the same fabric of life that the automobile has been to generations of Americans. The train still is to generations of Japanese. And so it was interesting to see that comparison because railroads operate very vitally for freight transport in the U.S., but largely out of public sight, uh, and it's not really appreciated or even noticed. But in a country like Japan, it's still very much a part of everyday life. And so it was just fascinating and eye-opening for me to, to see the difference of those two. For you, Scott, how did you get interested in trains and railroads, and what led you to your current position here? Oh, sure. Well, so I, I grew up in West Virginia uh, on the main line of the Chesapeake and Ohio. It was Chessie System and, and CSX by then. And the little town I was in, uh, St. Albans, just outside of Charleston, I mean, the railroad literally cut the town in half. 
for much of my childhood, uh, it was basically a six-track boulevard that ran elevated, I mean, not like on bridges, but on sort of an elevated earthwork right through the middle of town. Uh, and so it was unmistakable. Uh, it was a double-track main line, and there were two sidings on either side that they would park long coal trains on for uh, a junction with a, a coal branch that came in there. Uh, so it was just, I mean, it was the most prominent feature of the town. And every fall, the New River train would come through, pulled by the nickel plate 765 steam locomotive. And so, of course, my grandparents would take me down to the station to watch it come in. And I have these vivid memories of crisp fall mornings and straining your eyes down to the, to the horizon to, to see the headlight and to hear the whistle in the distance for the first time. And every summer we'd vacation uh, in eastern West Virginia in the Allegheny Mountains and go to Cass and ride Cass Scenic Railroad and have the chaise push us up to the top of Bald Knob. And and West Virginia is a state that would not be what it is uh, had it not been for the railroad. I mean, and for better and worse, uh, you know, there's there's been, you know, a lot of natural resource extraction that's happened there. The coal industry fueled the nation and powered so much of our growth uh, in the 20th century. Um, although it's not always been to the betterment of some of the communities there, there's certainly a lot of poverty. But on both sides, the, the railroad has just been a tremendously strong force and certainly brought opportunities to the state that would not have been there otherwise. And every community you go to in West Virginia, tracks are either there and active or there was a branch line that ran there at one point. Uh, and so it, it's impossible to escape. And every community there seems to have a strong appreciation for the railroad and for its role and its growth. So it's just, I mean, it's an indelible part of uh, the fabric of life and history and culture in West Virginia. So, I mean, growing up there, it's like, how could could I not become fascinated in trains and railroads and the interaction between the railroad and the landscape and people? And and so just all of that kind of of came up together and sort of fused into this lifelong interest that I, I certainly don't see ever abating. I've had some of my wife's friends will ask, you know, if there's if I ever think I'd get tired of trains, and it's like it's an irrelevant question for me because if, if I run out of interest in one topic, there's just so many other topics that, that the railroad touches on. And so it's this great lens to view the world through. As far as my interest in, in the visual side of things, I was drawing trains from the time I could hold a pencil, and I used to throw temper tantrums because I couldn't make round wheels <laughs> until, of course, my, my mom gave me uh, coins that I could trace, and then I was happy. Uh, and so I was, I was drawing from a very young age, and I took some art classes in, in high school and, and uh, enjoyed that, but at the same time, I, I got to a point where I could see things that I wanted to convey onto paper that I just didn't have the ability or the training to do. And, by the time I was in college, I was taking, uh, I did a mechanical engineering degree at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, and so there just wasn't much time to continue with art. But I still had this strong kind of creative urge and happened to meet a friend, uh, Paul Dedalius, who was a railroad photographer. We had a class together. He had a BNSF grain tag on his backpack. <laughs> so we, we found each other through that. And uh, he kind of showed me the ropes of photography and um, I, I took to it pretty quickly. And, and so for me, it really combines a lot of my interest. Growing up in West Virginia, again, I love the outdoors. And so photography is a way to get outside, kind of experience the environment and a way to, to really kind of focus your attention visually so that you appreciate things like light and shadow and line and how the railroad interacts with, with all of these landforms and environments that it goes through. And so for me, it's just a great way to portray something as broad and as impactful as the railroad. Uh, it just has, uh, it, leads, it lends itself very well to visual interpretation. And so photography is something that I've really grown to appreciate. And for me, it's really, I mean, I love the technology, and I love the equipment, but for me, kind of the, the interaction between that and the landscape and the people is, is really sort of where my, my interest views in photography is just a great way to, to be able to explore that. Uh, and so as I you know, got more active in photography, I, uh, I was lucky mainly through the internet and through a strong uh, a group of railroad photographers in Cleveland. I had a lot of great people to sort of help show me the way and give me encouragement and give me advice. And so I started writing articles and, and was lucky to have some photographs published. And that kind of led me to the center. I joined as a member. I attended a couple of the conferences at Lake Forest. And it just seemed to kind of bring all of these interests I had in photography and history and uh, and geography all kind of coalesced into one place. And so uh, after my wife and I got back from Japan, I presented on actually the role of the railroads in literature because I I have interest in, in literature and writing as well and had been amazed to find the railroad in so many different places and so many great novels and short stories by famous authors 
there were trains there, and that just fascinated me. And I thought that's something as a photographer I can learn from, because how Jack Kerouac depicts a Union Pacific streamliner streaking across the Nebraska desert, or how or the, the, the Nebraska uh, night and the cornfields, or how um, Thomas Wolfe depicts the streamliners uh, running between uh, New York City and, and North Carolina. All of these things are, are fascinating and interesting for me, and it shows how but seeing the railroad in literature really helps me to, to, I don't know, appreciate how, how trains and railroads are a part of American life and culture. And I thought as a photographer I could learn something from that, and I thought it would be interesting to share that with other photographers. And so that was the topic of my, my first presentation at the Center's Conference. Uh, and it was kind of a, a case of just one thing leading to another from there. John had a, a grant from the North American Railway Foundation to work on a new website, and I was able to, to help out and, and write some content and do some editing for that. And uh, it's, uh, it's grown from there. And when the organization was ready to hire a full-time executive director in 2011, I, I got the nod. Uh, Marina and I moved here from Oregon. Uh, we'll be here, it'll be seven years uh, in August of this year. And I hope, it, uh, I hope it continues to be a long run. It's certainly been a, a, a good ride so far. You clearly have a deep respect for seeing where that history lies and teasing it out. So how do you communicate that through the work that you do as the center? Sure, well, that's, a, that's a great question. From our, our very core identity, we try to collaborate as much as we can. I mean, we're sitting in our, our two-room office, there's a third room across the hall, but that's, you know, that's all the space that we have other than some off-site storage facilities. So we don't have a museum, we don't have a gallery, and it's important to us to, to take our work out into the into a, as broad a sphere of the public as we can, and so we love to work with other museums and organizations, universities, publishers, uh, to collaborate on our conferences, on our traveling exhibitions, on our publications. And every time we have the chance, we really try to work with organizations and institutions that are more mainstream, so that we can take these stories to a broader, you know, general public audience. And so. That's, I think, where we're able to leverage some of our strengths and our, our depth of knowledge about imagery, about photographers, about painters and other artists, and how the railroad fits into American life and culture, and pull some of those themes out and present them in a way that a more general audience might be able to understand and appreciate that, and maybe even connect it to some other interest in their life. You know, railroads build connections, and if we can build connections through our work, then I think we're, we're doing exactly what, we, what we're, we're setting out to do. Now, we certainly do a lot of work with railroad museums, and we're very proud of those partnerships. We have our David Plowden traveling exhibitions at the National Railroad Museum in Green Bay right now. But we also are able to work with some other uh, mainstream museums. The, the Groman Museum in Milwaukee is currently hosting our Wallace Abbey traveling exhibition. Uh, that's a museum that really focuses on industrial art of all kinds. Uh, and so railroad photographs are a great fit there, but it's only part of what they do. We have uh, our B.B. Clegg exhibition that we're putting together now to go with John Gruber and John Ryan's new book about Lucius Beebe and Charles Clegg. That's going to be opening at the California State Railroad Museum uh, this fall. And then our big project right now, there's a very significant milestone I'm sure we're all aware of in railroad history coming up next spring with the 150th anniversary of the completion of the first transcontinental railroad. We spent a lot of time thinking about how we could contribute to that. I mean, this is, this is a time when not just the railroad community, but the entire American public, even if it's just for a moment, is going to have their attention focused on the railroads. And the transcontinental railroads really helped to realign the country from a north-south agrarian nation into an east-west agricultural or industrial nation. And coming out of that right after the Civil War, when we had a, you know, a very divided and contentious nation, the railroads helped us create a new national identity and, and uh, found a new way to grow and move forward and build a, a nation that really is east to west, industrial, Atlantic to Pacific. And that all came about through the railroads. While there's going to be a lot of attention focused on Promontory Utah and Ogden, uh, and that original Union Pacific, Central Pacific line, we thought that this is a story that, that touches not just those communities, but really every community in the west that ever had a railroad in it. And it's all kind of part of the same story. And so our project we're calling After Promontory, 150 Years of Transcontinental Railroading. And so while it takes that original line as its basis, we expand the narrative to include all of the transcontinental railroads, their construction, but also their impact. So we have a mix of historic images from you know, some of the, the really well-known blue-chip photographers from the 19th century, people like A.J. Russell, Alfred Hart, Carlton Watkins, but then also contemporary photographers. Uh, Richard Steinheimer, Parker Lamb from our own collection, 
uh, people like Drake Hokanson, Mark Ruedel, uh, artists that are, are really looking at the railroad's lingering role in the landscape. And so our project looks at the construction of all of the transcontinental railroads and how they reshaped the West and then what their lasting impact is. There's parts of the original transcontinental line that are just abandoned right-of-ways out in the middle of the Utah desert, and there's parts of it that are bustling three-track main lines across Wyoming and Nebraska. And what led one line to go one way and one to go the other? And you know, why is the Milwaukee Road a bike trail now, and the, the Great Northern sees 40 trains a day? And what impact has that had on the nation? I mean, you know, Portland, Oregon is one of the, the largest grain terminals in the world, and it's because the railroads can bring the grain off of the Montana and Dakota and Washington prairies down to port and for shipment all over the world. You know, Los Angeles and Long Beach and all the container terminals down there and in Oakland, I mean, this is all part of the transcontinental railroad story. And it's, it's really part of the story of globalization in the 21st century. And the railroads have a very strong role in that. And we thought that we could engage wider audiences with our After Promontory project by talking about not just the original line, but all of the lines and their collective impact on building the nation. And so we're, we're working with several different organizations to host different components of a traveling exhibit. And we're also working again with Indiana University Press on a 320-page book that's going to um, tell the story uh, through photographs. And we've been able to, to target uh, several mainstream uh, museums and galleries to host this show. And we're excited to be announcing some of those later this summer and, and uh, hopefully have, we'll have a long run. We hope that with a title like After Promontory, we'll be able to keep the show going beyond 2019 and take it not just to venues along that original line, but all over the West. There's more about that on our website, but that's something that, uh, that I'm really excited about. And I think it will give us a chance to take the railroad story into broader audiences and, and hopefully make some connections, bring more people into the railroad community, and also just let wider audiences all over the country see a little bit more of how the railroad has, has impacted our life and history even as it is today. I'm glad you're taking that approach. There's the temptation, certainly when you look at children's history books, if railroads get mentioned, it's just the Transcontinental Railroad, and that's kind of it. And as a community, I think it is important for us to be able to communicate Yes, we're recognizing the 150th anniversary of the completion, but we need to use that as a driving force because this is one of our few shots to have railroading discussed in the mainstream in a positive light, and especially railroad history in the mainstream in a positive light. So to be able to ride that momentum and try to hook as many people as we can into what railroads mean today and have that as an incubator for that, I think is really crucial. Yeah, no, it's, it's an exciting opportunity and certainly one that we want to capitalize on and, and make the most that we absolutely can. Uh, we know there's going to be a lot of, of attention from other organizations in, you know, focused in Utah and, and on the original line. And we wanted to find a way to, to not compete, but to complement those activities and, and hopefully, again, expand the story and take it to as many audiences as, as we can, hopefully grow our community and at least use our knowledge and expertise and, and resources to make broader connections and, and let more of the general public see you know, the role that railroads have played and continue to play in American history and life and even in, in, in global history and life. So Scott, the work that you're doing here is really impressive, but all of that obviously between trying to go through the process of locating, acquiring, and being able to catalog these very comprehensive collections. All that takes a good amount of capital. So how does your organization operate financially? Well, I mean, we're just so fortunate to have such a passionate community that supports our work. Uh, we have over 700 members uh, throughout the United States who give generously to support our mission. We've been fortunate to secure some grants from outside funding sources. We get some revenue through our, our conference and through our exhibitions and occasionally through photo usage, but it's largely a membership-supported organization. We have a tremendous board of directors, including me. There's 14 members on it. They come from all walks of life and from all over the country, and they bring tremendous connections, passion, enthusiasm, volunteerism, whether it's sitting down to help generate a membership mailing, going to events and talking about the center, introducing us to people who might be interested in supporting our work. I think any nonprofit lives or dies on the strength of its board, and we are so fortunate to have tremendously supportive board of directors. 
Uh, our chairman, uh, Bon French, is a lifelong uh, railroad enthusiast. He's photographed more than 700 different railroads, uh, mainly in the United States. He has, uh, he likes to say, he has the immodest goal of photographing every railroad, from the great big class ones to the little short lines that have, you know, one, uh, one Jeep that runs a few times a week. Bon really likes to get out and photograph all of them. Uh, and He's just kind of the ideal uh, chairman of an organization. He gives generously, he makes connections, he supports our work, and he also takes a very hands-off approach. And you know, he really, he really lets, uh, lets me and the staff kind of set our goals and priorities. I mean, the, the board is setting the overall goals, and, and, but in terms of carrying out the day-to-day -day mission, I think we just have a great synergy and, and direction there. We have uh, everyone on our board is available for questions and resources and guidance. So it's, it's, I think we just have a really great group assembled. We have members all over the country who attend our, our conferences, our exhibitions. Most of our photo collections have been donated to us, uh, some with requests, the financial uh, requests that help with the funding and processing work. So all of that helps make us go forward. Our, our uh, Robert Heritage Journal is a benefit of membership. Basic membership level is $50 a year, and that includes four issues of the journal and discounted pricing on, on our conferences and events. And so if I can just make that brief plug, if, you, if you're passionate about railroad photography and imagery and, and preserving this, uh, this material and, and also making it available and accessible, if you're not already a member, uh, we'd love to have you aboard. You can sign up on our website or get in touch with me. We'd love to make that happen, and it supports every single thing that we do. We couldn't function uh, without the support of our community. And, you know, the more people we can get on board, the more photographs we can preserve and present. When you look at the future of the organization, what are directions that you're hoping to go, either in terms of your own facilities or how you're able to display and share the collections? We're living in a time where it's, it's so easy to share photographs and other information uh, through the Internet. And, and I think we're, we're very fortunate, and this was, this was some of the genius of our founder, John Gruber, and as our board has continued to carry forth, uh, we don't need a big gallery space. So we can work with other museums that specialize on getting people to come in and, and see exhibitions. We can focus on creating those exhibits, preserving the photographs that make them possible, doing publications. So we're able to operate you know, with a, a pretty lean and small footprint. And I think that gives us a lot of flexibility and these ever-changing times in the 21st century, we're able to sort of look at what the opportunities are and, and go out and seek them. A few years ago, we had a, a great opportunity to partner with the Chicago History Museum on an exhibition about Jack Delano's photographs from World War II of, of railroad workers and do genealogical research to find the descendants of those people in those 1940s photographs, and do oral histories and interviews with them to kind of flesh out biographies of those people. And through that, we were able to create an ex exhibition that really showed Chicago's railroad community. And by making it into a community exhibition, I mean, Chicago is the nation's railroad hub. Everyone who lives in Chicago has someone who worked for the railroad at some point. Uh, and so this was an enormously popular exhibition. Uh, I think it was seen by a, close to half a million people in the two years it was at the History Museum. And so it's looking for opportunities like that. Those don't come along every day. Things like the, the 150th anniversary of the Golden Spike don't come along every day. But, you know, we, we hope to find them and, and take advantage of them as they come. You know, so we're always looking for opportunities to, to tell those bigger stories in bigger places. But we do have to kind of be opportunistic with that because we don't have our own space, and so we're kind of reliant on finding the right partner institution. And so we want to be open and flexible to, to seeking out and, and capitalizing on those efforts, while at the same time continuing to, to build up the organization with our archival processing work. We rent our office space right now. We'd like to eventually move into a larger space, perhaps someday even one that we actually own. And we're also, we've had the great fortune to be able to, to establish an endowment fund to provide some regular long-term funding. I mean, that's I know we are incredibly fortunate in this community and in all museum communities to, to benefit from that. And we hope to be able to systematically grow that so that we can have continued funding through that as well as through our, our membership and our other work. So it's kind of a, a, a case of continuing to build on what we're doing and to just do more of it and to do it as well as we can. And also look for those opportunities when we're able to, to take these stories to, to larger audiences. So, you know, we want to we want to preserve more photographs. We want to get more collections under, under our care. We want to continue to do publications, exhibitions, take them to more places. And then look for those opportunities when we can work with some other partner institution or, you know, one or more 
and, and really be able to, to tell some big stories and find that right balance between continuing to build on what we're already doing, just to do it well, to make sure that we're not getting ahead of ourselves and, and trying to be too ambitious, but still being as ambitious as we can to take on and preserve as many photographs and, and artwork as we can continue to grow our publications, our traveling exhibition program, and then you know, look for those opportunities to, to work with larger organizations and institutions and, and tell the biggest stories possible and get the most people that we can to, to see the importance of railroading uh, both in the past and also the present and hopefully the future too. At the end of the day, why are you grateful about the work that you're doing with this organization? Mm, that's a great question. I, I mean, I think there's so many reasons. On a very personal level, it gives me the chance to connect with so many people who are so passionate about railroad history and railroad imagery and the role of railroads in the community today. And just building those relationships, uh, you know, and getting to work with our board, with our members, with our contributors, uh, with our partner institutions. I mean, all of that's just incredibly rewarding and a lot of fun. This is a chance for me to be able to take this, this lifelong interest that I have, build a career out of it, and hopefully, you know, build some of those connections and use our kind of collective expertise on railroad history and photography and imagery to tell stories that large audiences can connect with and relate to. And I mean, I know it sounds very, you know, high and ambitious, but hopefully we can all see a little bit more of, of our humanity and our collective shared experiences in that. I mean, I think we're living at a time when any opportunity we have to, to bridge cultural or, or other boundaries. We have a lot of divisions in the world and in our nation right now. And if we can find things that we have shared experiences in, you know, that are something that, that touch all of our lives and, and give us a chance for a shared dialogue, the railroads do give us a chance to do that because they are so pervasive and so instrumental in, in the history of the United States and much of the developed world, touch lives in so many ways. So it's, it's, just incredibly rewarding for me to be able to, to take that one thing that I have this lifelong passionate interest about and be able to have a career in that and, and hopefully an impact um, in the railroad community and, and also in the, the world at large. When you look at the larger networks that are created by railroads, both literally and figuratively, and the people networks that exist because of that, especially in this day and age, in this digital world that we inhabit, where we're able to have these conversations that have no bounds, no borders, it really broadens the capability of what we're able to do. And especially an organization like yours, where you're looking to showcase a variety of different lenses, pardon the pun, uh, as far as looking at railroading culture in the U.S. and internationally. I think having the international component in particular is important. Yeah, no, I would agree. And uh, we're actually really excited to, to be taking on, and this is actually the first public announcement of this, but we're going to be taking on Victor Hand's photography collection. Uh, his first batch of, of negatives should be arriving next week. Uh, and Victor's someone who's published many books and traveled all over the world, mainly in search of steam locomotives. But through that has taken in much of the, the culture uh, surrounding railroading in every inhabited continent in the world. And I think, uh, like our, spread, our Fred Springer collection, this gives us another tremendous opportunity to, to look at railroading through, through many different lenses, many different cultures, and many different places. And so I hope we can continue to do, to do more of that. Uh, you know, again, as we, we live in this, this ever more connected global world, the railroad continues to play a role in that, and it's exciting to me to think of some of the other stories we can tell as we go forward. And the stories that you'll be writing along the way. Absolutely. Scott, thank you so much for joining us here on The Roundhouse and sharing the important work that you're doing with the Center for Railroad Photography and Art. This is really interesting stuff. I look forward to having the opportunity to view one of your galleries in some point in the future but it's been great to have this conversation. Oh, Nick, it's been my absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for getting in touch and uh, for stopping by the office to talk with us today. Big thanks to Scott for joining us here on The Roundhouse. To check out their work, visit railphoto-art.org. And now, the question of the day. Last time on The Roundhouse, we were traveling aboard the Silver Solarium, an ex-California Zephyr dome observation car on the Cuyahoga Valley Scenic Railroad. And that raised the question, what is your favorite type of passenger car to travel in? A lot of interesting responses. First, let's go to Facebook. Jim Lipnitz writes, 
If there's an open air car on the train, I'll pay any upcharge or surcharge to ride it, even events such as the Long John Limited in February, which I already have tickets for. The Long John Limited, for those who don't know, that's the Strasbourg Railroad has an open air car, which they run in the winter in February. So it's kind of a test of endurance type of thing. It's a really creative idea on their part. So <laughs> very creative, Jim. This from Sebastian Marconi. There's nothing like sitting in an NKP heavyweight Pullman behind an NKP Burke. That's a great experience to have at the Steam in the Valley event, Sebastian. And lastly, from Will Astel. Sorry if I got your last name wrong, Will. I've ridden on the Dover Harbor, and it was amazing. Back in the 90s, it still had the vestibule on the back, and I rode it the whole time. The Dover Harbor is an absolutely gorgeous car, Will. The DC NRHS chapter is fantastic at the upkeep of it, providing unique experiences with it. From Twitter, Glenn says, Marion at the Strasburg Railroad is by far my favorite car that I've ridden on. Your question of the day for this episode is... What is your favorite form of railroad art? Let me know on the roundhousepodcast.com. Hey, while you're there, check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash the roundhouse. If you like this show and you want to help to support what we do, help us to grow what we're capable of doing as far as covering events and stuff like that, visit the roundhousepodcast.com. Click on the Patreon link or go to patreon.com slash the roundhouse. Consider even just a dollar a month supporting the show goes a long way. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, remember that the roundhouse is our house.